morning everyone um it's basically morning in japan but i don't know what time time it is for you but um let's start some sculpting so uh we left over the sculpt like this last time and we fiddled the fingers last stream and um basically it has a bit of posing now and for this stream I want to work on the um, hairs because currently the hair is not like it's not really edited yet so I'm gonna work on that so let's just basically edit some tweaks and fixes before we go there oh for this one um, I just use the basic um, basic shape from the light box so if you go to light box and if you go to projects you have that dice primitive and if you go to the, I think I use the 12 sided. And if you go to the 12 sided and if you divide it a bit up without smoothing, you have this kind of like shape, right? And then if you go to the Z plugin and use the Bebel Pro, you basically open up a another application which is bevel pro and you can set some parameters from here and i don't need a chamfer and then if i don't press auto apply it sends out this geometry and it's set as live boolean with the negative setting applied to it but if you just get rid of the um, negative setting and then you can just basically use this as your geometry so um, i just use this for the base and i can add some smoothing for example and you basically get the shape so going back to the going back to the data so you can see what I did here I just um, reach apologize it using um, zero mesh So yeah, you can use Bevel Pro for um, making round shapes on the corners, or you can use it as some like geometrical shapes for interesting geometries. It's it's pretty fun. You can try out a bunch of things to actually see what happens. And I'm gonna use the um, curved tubes for this one. Uh, what I, um, last time I used the um, ex extrude profile with the I think it was a triangle and with the um, curve modifiers with the size and removing the repel strength so I just use this for the base I'm gonna remove the subdivision levels for a bit mm, the birds are tweaking <laughs> I seem, I seem to have a nest outside of the, the window, so um, somehow the, the birds are like, tweeting, tweeting in the morning. So basically I just use the um, 
the IMM curve brushes to actually get the shapes done. And if you're familiar with IMM curves, you can also use the picker setting. And I usually recommend the closest D for the hairs because um, if you use the closest D, it's like detecting the closest position to the camera and like if you leave off the geometry it stays there but if you set the picker to constant z it's going to pick up the pick up the surface information no matter what so um, it's trying to follow the surface depth but you usually don't want to have this so um, i usually recommend the closest z from the picker and it would stay along the depth where it left off and it doesn't follow along the surface that much i just need some couple of like base shapes so I can just use this as a base to actually start editing. And once I have the basic shapes done, uh, I can just move around. And I usually combine, I think I just introduced this every single stream, but I use the um, snake hook with the brush, auto masking, topological setting, and then just move around the mesh. If you have the topological setting, it's easier to just like move the individual strands. Yeah, it's a new feature added from I think it was the 2021 we've been adding adding like so much features I I lost track of <laughs> track of things it's very handy like it's very handy for hairs especially and it's very handy for like chains and stuff that's dangling around the surface. Is there an IG or FB to be in touch with your you besides this live sessions? Um, I'm I'm a bit busy. Um, it's hard for me to like be in touch I guess I usually am active around the discord servers so um, you can check that out as well uh, if you have any questions you can get in touch with the oh um, I need to go to the twitch wait a second Oh yeah, here you go. So you can get in touch with the Discord. Oh no, you can you can join the Discord and then get in touch. But currently, I don't really respond to like um, DMs because um, some some people are st spamming me <laughs> for some reason. And um, if you need some like technical um, issues solved, you need to contact the um, support team from the support page. Hello.
Oh, nice. Thanks. I'm just casually, casually sculpting along. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of ways you can like create the base for the hairs. I just usually use the use the IMM curves and then use the snake cut to like just build some things. But you can you can use multiple methods. I did a stream where I explained the entire like uh, multiple methods that you can use for the hairs. You can check that out as well. Um, I'm gonna remove the spam that is getting posted all the time. And when you're creating some hairs, um, the important thing is that you don't want to break the silhouette. So you need to check from the front and from the side and see it, if it's not like obstructing some like silhouettes that you want to keep. And also when you're making some hairs, especially for 3D prints, um, it's important that you um, consider these like um, hairs on the back to be hitting the skull because well the, the back of the head basically because if you have a gap in between those shapes it's it looks very odd so um, it's better to just fill those space up I usually make a separate mesh just for the uh, just for the filling the hairs, but it depends on your workflow. I don't really have a plan for like printing out this model, but um, you can do that by just tweaking the mesh to be suitable for three D prints. Splitting the mesh entirely for like just, just prepping for 3D print is a bit boring for the stream, so I prefer not to stream. But it's just a simple method of like just breaking the parts around, just filling, and then adding some live booleans. A couple of other streamers are covering that topic with the keying tutorials, so you can check that videos out.
in my personal projects, I tend to like sculpt for um, eight hours straight or something like that. But like during the stream, it's just a two hours for the ZBrush live stream. So for me, um, two hours is very short for me. So I need to get my um, designs pretty much like pre prepped beforehand. But the challenge of the stream is to get the um, the designs as I go along. So um, yeah, it's a bit fun for for a challenge for me but at the same time like i'm, I'm very um, nervous when it comes to like live streaming because um i'm not really sure if i can do the designs at that like short amount of time and at, at the same time i'm very excited to like sculpt and lives like, like do some live creations because i'm not really sure what it ends up being and that's part of the fun process. Yeah, I think eight hours is a average kind of like number for a lot of like professional sculptors like i i i need to sculpt at least like four hours straight to actually get my like engines started so i'm a very slow starter for those kind of like stuff So I made the basic shape for the hairs now. I just need to color fill them in so I can get the kind of like look I want. And since this is a bit rough right now, I can just like tweak the shapes a bit. And like you can see from the hairs that it's like like evenly like spaced. If you're making some hairs, if it's evenly spaced, something is wrong. So like there needs to be a bunch of strands that's like going along, and at the same time you need to have a bit of space in between some of them. So it doesn't look even. So so you need to make some like a flow in between the shapes, and also you need to consider if you're having some like hoodie, and if it's like penetrating the hoodie, it's like destroying the entire. Um, stuff so what I need to do is I need to consider there's a hoodie and I need to move around so I can avoid the collisions so usually I just make the basic shapes and then if I need to consider something else then I'll try to do that And then if I adjust it like this, I just need to remove the hoodie and then make sure it doesn't look odd when it's when it doesn't have the hoodie. So you can see here that 
the hairs are getting pushed too much. And you, you can see there's um, uneven, like th there's a there's a huge um, indent on the surface here. So it looks a bit odd. So you just need to straighten this out and then make it make it a bit more smoother. And if your base mesh is pretty much done, you can start like combining the hair strands so it looks a bit more natural. Currently, this like the the top part of the hair is like currently bald. <laughs> she does look a bit more like a old style, like a preacher or or a person from the church. <laughs> you need to adjust this if this is not your like desired hairstyle. <laughs> yeah, if your intent is making some like Francisco Xavier kind of like um, hairstyle, it, it, it's fine. <laughs> But like usually it's not the style you're looking for, right? So So what I usually do at this point is that like I need to fill the gap between the um, hairs by pulling them off from the um, individual strands and then make them, making some overlaps. And then after that, I usually just like combine them with Dynamesh. And I usually split the um, the front half of the hairs and then the back of back half of the hairs so um, it looks more like it's, it's easy easier to control like especially for 3d printing and like making some like models out of it it's better to just like split them in half and if you have a more technical like difficult hair like for example if you have more strands that needs to be a bit more controlled and uh, you can split them into like three or four um, whatever you like so so at this point you need to just care about how it looks from the front and like if it looks natural or not and then you can deal with this kind of like pointiness at, at the top and later on so first of all um, since I'm using the IMM curves to actually get these shapes um, you can see there's like multiple polygroups in one geometry so I just need to use the polygroups and alter groups to give individual strands a different kind of like polygroups and I'm gonna use this as a base to actually get the split between the front and the back and I'm gonna add some polygroups like so and for this example I think I should add this to the front because 
Um, I think this major part is the separation between the um, front and the back because basically you have the ears in this kind of like area. So I'm going to split the polygroups to a different geometry. So if you have subdivision levels, go to the bottom of the subdivision levels and then split hidden. And you have now two separate geometries from this kind of like mesh. And what I need to do is I need to tweak them slightly so um, it's suitable for DynaMesh. I just need to fill the middle parts so it's easier to just fix them after afterwards. And if you want some like precision or, or better control over uh, what kind of like shape it comes out, um, you can split the um, split this additionally so you can have a more finer control over the shapes. But for now, for me, like I don't need that kind of like precision control. I just need to have the meshes combined so um, I can just tweak them around later on. So let's see here. I just need to connect these. And since we have a bit of a individual mesh here. I just need to connect these. Okay, looks fine. Um, I can just connect them. So let's just use the DynaMesh method. I think I should just split and uh, divide a couple of times beforehand so it has a smoother surface. And um, 512, I guess. Then Dynamesh. I don't need to project them. And basically, here's the result. So it's combined into one, and it has a bit of gaps. So. I need a smoother top, so I'm going to remove, uh, reduce the um, these kind of like sharp points that are generated by the um, IMM curves because it's it was individual, right? So I just want to have a stronger smooth. Um, if you're familiar with the settings, um, I think I've shown multiple times, uh, you can change the weighted smooth mode. To one, which you can find it inside the brush smooth brush mode modifiers, and then you can change this to weighted smooth mode one by pressing shift key, and you're gonna have a smoother um, result with the well the strongest uh, stronger result result with smooth, and if you don't know the settings, you can go to the brush from Lightbox and then if you switch to the smooth you have the smooth stronger um, strong uh, smooth stronger brush and you can load it up and then you can just assign to the new smooth brush hello Dusky according to you in the anime figure collectible industry what are they looking for in a sculptor um, basically, I think the best um, answer I can give is that they are looking for a sculptor who can replicate the character very well. So, um, especially in Japanese like sculpting industries, the the skill that you need is 
um, skill they require is that they are looking for a sculptor who can replicate the character's feel and look, especially the illustrators, like the original like illustrators, like feel and look to the sculpt. So it needs to look exactly like the illustration. And that's the priority first, because it's not the customers, that, uh, well, it's not the companies that are looking for it, it's mo more the customers are looking for those kind of like, things, because they like the illustrations, they like the characters, and like they want that exact like look in a figurine. So like they don't really look for a like original kind of like look original looking um, sculpt if they want to buy it so it, it's natural that the industry would like seek for a sculptor who can replicate the character the look and feel to fit the customer's needs right so that's the priority and second secondly um, they are looking for a person who can sculpt very well. So it's quality and then speed. So if you look at like um, Sakaki's um, Prince Prince Eugen uh, model that he made uh, earlier on I think it was like two or three years ago um, he's like showing the method um, using ZBrush to actually make some um, a precision uh, model or a, a precise um, copy from the um, original illustrations and like you can see how he um, does the um, process very well like he, he's doing it very quick and at the same time like he's spending a lot of like time like trying to replicate the look the level of modern is very high they are yeah there's a lot of like talented people around making figurines and like especially um like anime models especially in japan is very like popular so people tend to be very good at their craft it's, it's very competitive like it became very competitive after like digital was introduced into the workflow as well because you had a lot of like artists who are doing like digital like three three Ds to like move to the um, figurine industry as well. Traditionally, a lot of like artists went to like game studios or uh, pachinko industries, but after like digital was introduced into like the figurine world um, those people who were making those kind of stuff were like shifted and came into the figurine industry so the figurine quality inter like improved over time because you had a lot of people who can go to that industry they think still there's opportunity to enter um, yeah, people are looking, like, always looking for talented people. So, like, if you if you want to take a shot, then just contact the companies who are looking for talented people. Like, some companies might not have the, like, um, the communication skills for um, English-speaking um, employees because like some companies are like small they don't really have the, um, the resources to actually have a english-speaking employee in their like companies but 
we can try to contact them, see what they have, and then start from there. But not not a lot of like companies are um, able to like like use their resources for English um, employees. So. It depends. <laughs> it depends on the um, the size of the company and how much resource they have. Like, especially in Japan, um, people who can speak English is a rare talent. And like, I don't really see much people who can speak English and sculpt at the, at the same time. So, um, like. It's one of the few, like, I, I, I think I'm the one of the few people who can do that kind of stuff. So I sometimes feel a bit of a responsibility when it comes to, like, introducing sculpting skills from Japanese to English and English to Japanese. So you can see that I just like smoothed around the mesh on the um, outer side. So it looks more natural now. But now I need to fix the inside so I can um, adjust them easily after on, later on. And usually I use the backface masking for this one. So if I press the smooth brush and then um, backface masking it's not gonna affect the other side and you need to check the version specifically but I think this was fixed in the 2020 version and the earlier version had a bit of a bug where it didn't like the backface masking wasn't affecting the smooth brush Yeah, speaking two languages is a bit of a hard task for a lot of people. <laughs> Especially for Japanese, like, um, English education, it's not really good, so. Like, they, usually, Japanese students suffer from, like, six years of like English education they don't like and like they just need to suffer for a long time long amount of time they build some like allergic reactions to it so um don't blame them if they have a hard time like reading through English but uh, some people don't have any issues so it depends on the per person's like education skills and experiences and some companies are like especially looking, looking for like in English sculptures recently um, because there's a lot of like interest from overseas um, especially for the figurine industries and some companies are looking forward for like foreign artists to join their workforces but it depends on the company, so it depends on the scale of the company, the resources. So you never know, you just need to contact them. Yeah, especially for English, um, like I had to learn it <laughs> because like I was chucked into a native school in England and I had to learn it by like necessity, but 
I think necessity or like the love for the culture is the main reason you can learn a specific language. So if you don't really have any interest and, and like you can't really force your, force yourself to actually learn that, spe learn that specific language. So I, I understand why people like build some like um, allergic reactions to a specific language. Like especially they like they don't want it to learn that specific language. They they had to like learn it by like for um, tests and like for universities and stuff like that. So understandable. And um, especially when I talk to people who um, who can speak English and they want some like translator from Japan and um, and I try to talk with them and then they expect a typical Japanese English person who can speak English and when I come up um, talking to them they will be th th their faces will be um, looking God because like I have a British kind of like accent and with American kind of like mix between them. <laughs> and it's very odd for them because they were expecting some somebody who is not really good at their English or like they have a specific like Japanese accent to it. So <laughs> Okay, so I edited the front side of the Hair. Now I need to work on the back side of the hair, and before I need to, before I can like continue on like merging these hairs, I think I need to like adjust the over overall shell silhouette of the hairs because it looks a bit dented in here. And if you're not really like sure how it looks, like with the colors on, um, I usually recommend turning off the colors and then just picking some like basic materials to actually look at the shapes. Like you can see there's a bit of a bit of a dent here. And well, I usually don't want some like dent the hairs, like because it's gonna um, like determine the shape, especially how the um, the the skull, the, how their face looks, or how their head looks. So hair is a bit important when it comes to like checking the volumes and checking the outside shapes. And sometimes, for example, um, if you have a shape like this and it's not giving you the result you want, you can also use the zero measure to actually get some like free topologies done. We stop wall what? Um, a bit sleepy. <laughs> I don't know why, but I'm like recently like sleepy and hungry all the time. So, but pretty happy and 
just happy that I can stop the stream. And I need to I need to finish my like sculpting that I started like a couple of months ago and that's the only concern I really have right now. Uh not this one, my personal projects. I forgot the term. What what do you call those? Um, uh, what do you call those uh, like habits that you um, hold on to something and then don't come back? Um, what do you call those? Starts with P. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I forgot the term. And for example, for the char for this character, I want the um, left side of the hairs to be a bit. Oh yeah, procrastinate. Yes. Yeah, so I I have a habit of like procrastinating things, and it's a very bad habit. Like I tend to like just put things on hold for like a couple of months for no reason, and I just come back later on like regretting myself and I didn't really spend the full time. <laughs> yeah, it's a bad habit. Like I, I need to break that habit. Like if I if I can break that habit, I like I I I only like spend a couple of like weeks to actually get some one specific model, but like because of the procrastination, like I spend more than like six months to actually get a specific model that I like. So it's, it's not a good habit. Could you find some job in Japan as a 3D artist? Yeah, um, depends on what kind of like job you're looking for. But for example, there's a lot of like, um, um, there's a lot of like video game industries um, which is looking for 3D artists and there's a pachinko industry who is looking for 3D artists as well and when it comes to like like movies there's not much like movie industries in Japan so the only concern is that point like if you're looking for movie industries specifically in Japan it's better to have a background in like those kind of like industries prior to like going to Japan because like a lot of companies are looking for a Hollywood quality videos uh, but they can't really afford the artists that's the the, the the shame of the Japanese like 3d industries especially for especially for movies and like game industries like they don't they they want the qualities but they can't afford the quality yeah um like some some like companies are like hiring a English speaker for assistance so they can just like communicate well with the um, English artists and uh, like for example I think there was a Square Enix Square Enix hired uh, is hiring some like management assistants so they can speak English and communicate with this English artist even though they have a very good skill 
and like they don't really need to speak in Japanese. So um, it depends on the industry. But there's a couple of like uh, um, industries or th there's a couple of companies who are already hiring uh, foreign workers or English speaking workers um, because of their skill and not for their language skills. Like, as, as I said, it's like it's difficult to find a good artist who can speak Japanese and English at the same time. So it doesn't really make sense if you're like looking for an artist who can work for you but like they they are like charging extra money because they can speak japanese so that's very <laughs> that's very hard for people to find as well so Um, Japan is best for games. Yeah, um, I'm really hyped about the Elden Ring they just like released. I haven't played the game yet. Like I, I'm, I'm trying to get it. <laughs> I'm just looking for a time to actually play the game. So I played the Sekiro series, and like. Um, we try. We did some like um, zebrush merge, which is a Japanese like version of the um, zebrush um, zebrush summit in Japan. We didn't do the 2020 or the the recent versions, but um, we did one in 2019, and we had a from software team just presenting some awesome artworks. I really wish um, the language like language would not be a, a issue in the future because there's a lot of like things that are like awesome in Japan and I think a lot of like English speaking nations would need to like know but at the same time like I wish um, like some of the English knowledge are like spread into Japanese audiences as well. Like for one example, like I'm kind of like baffled how much people are just stuck with like the idea of topology or clean having a clean topology when it comes to like making hard surface models. Like in my mind, you can make some designs and then work with the topologies later on. But um, in Japan, it's more typical to like have a cleaner topology from the get go and then like not need to worry about some topologies as you go along so for me it like that's a bit a bit of a huge obs obstruction when it comes to like um, asking people to like just go on with like Dynamesh to get some like hard surface models because you never know like what kind of like design you can come up with like working with Dynamesh but they just tend to like focus on the topology. So that's the sad part of like um, the difference between the um, the cultures. But yeah, there's, there's some kind of like stuff like that. Elden Ring looks very promising. Sekiro at the moment is my favorite from. <laughs> um, Sekiro is br brutal in every way, but like I really love the game. And another name is Toei Animation. Um, yeah, for, for the Toei Animations, um, I heard about the um, 
like the allegations with the like the copyright issues with the YouTuber who is like doing some like anime reviews and like in Japan it's like it's a very, very different culture like especially like what I think I mentioned about the um, copyright differences in Japan and in like English um, side of the world and in Japan there's no fair use so for for the Japanese companies who are handling like copyright materials um, like they don't really have to deal with the um, fair use um, side of the like copyright and in Japan like that's totally fine so um, like you can't like review anime show, like you can't review animes like showing the actual footage in Japan if you want to when, wanted to make some like anime YouTube channels so in Japan like that is totally normal but in the YouTube like Western YouTube world and that's a huge no-no right <laughs> um, I think Toei animation like was like surprised to see it was an issue so I wouldn't blame them but sometimes like I feel that like YouTube um, creators that like who are making those kind of like, um, animations or like who are like reviewing other people's like properties especially like copyright materials um, sometimes they need to care about the um, the copyright that doesn't like like copyright doesn't have an international law or international copyright laws so um, they need to take in consideration that it's not a thing but at the same time like the companies do need to learn about the other side of the world as, as well so there's a bit of a culture difference that I can see from both sides <laughs> Ashina, yeah. My favorite boss is the first boss from the Sekiro series. What was, what was his name? Like, Onyua Gyobu? I really like him. <laughs> I really like him. Like, um, I really like the fact that you can, um, like, force him to get off the cliff if you're smart enough. And you don't need to do any damage to actually kill him. <laughs> That's crazy. I did try to like contact the um, from software team to actually give me give us some like interviews, but um, there was a couple of like issues with the um, time and process and schedule. It didn't really f flourish. <laughs> yeah, the the use of the use of the revival mechanics is very fun because even the enemies is using it. So <laughs> it's very fun. Yeah, it depends on the um, age, but 
I think there's not, like a lot of like cultures coming from Japan as well. So for example, Yu-Gi-Oh is one of the cultures that I dip deep in from Japan, and like a lot of like Westerners love Yu-Gi-Oh. Pokemon is one thing, and like they don't realize, but like uh, Mario, Mario Brothers or like Mar Mario sixty four. Um, was a Japanese game, so <laughs> so yeah. Basically, Mario is Japanese culture. And additionally, like for example, if you like Smash Bros, Smash Bros is a Nintendo game, so basically Japanese game. Okay, let's just combine this into one mesh and then like clean the surface up a bit. I just need a bit of 512 resolution, I guess. And then using the smooth backface masking, just need to like smooth the surface up. Um, preserve most details um, usually you don't really need to preserve the details like it's just better to just use the zero mesh and then project method I can show you one example like for example um, if I have a mesh like this and like it's like very pointy right and I want the mesh to be remeshed but I want to like retain the, the actual shape of the hairs. What I can do is that I can click on the current shape with the under history. So I need to press control key and press the undo history. So it puts a white mark on the under history. And then this is very like high detailed mesh, right? So it has 1.5 million polys and I don't really need that amount so what I need to do is I need to reduce this with zero mesh and I think 10k would be fine adaptive size would be 20 and let's see what happens it takes a bit of time because I'm streaming and doing other things at the same time it's eating up the CPU resources, but just wait a second. And now I have a bit of a reduced kind of like mesh, right? So it's easy for me to clean up the mesh with a low kind of count of polys, but at the same time, like I lost the, um, the details on the surface so what I need to do is I divide a couple of times well usually once and then project so I divide it once and I go to the subtool and then use the project project history and it projected the history so it, it's projecting the projecting this shape to the shape that I just zero mesh. So I do the divide again, project history, and I'm gonna repeat this a couple of times so I have a cleaner mesh.
So now I have a cleaner, cleaner topology with most of the um, the details preserved. So this is usually what I do when it comes to like cleaning up meshes. And the the benefit of like using zero mesh is that you can like remove these kind of like artifacts that was like very hard to remove on the 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 mesh beforehand. And also you can like because you have the entire like subdivision levels, you can basically use this as a benefit as well so if you need to preserve the uh, mesh by using zero measure just just using zero measure it's it's a bit hard to do but if you're using like a combination with zero measure and the project history it's very easy to do it depends on your usage but like for example, if you're using it to like preserve the mesh so it's like ready for like game models, um, I don't think it's the way to go. Like zero mesher is um, best at what it does for like especially for like sculpting is very good for that. But if you need to make the mesh specifically for movies or games that needs to move around um, I think it's better to just do the manual retopology because you need to have a bit more control on the polygons or where the polygons go No problem. Okay, so I got the hairs to be like looking like a single shape, right? Now I need to like adjust this so it doesn't look very odd. Currently the width of the hairs is, is like very even, so it looks very odd, right? So what I need to do is add different kind of like strands. Yeah, I just started with IMM brushes. So I'm just adjusting a bit and then adding new strands. Oh, I'm starving. <laughs> I need to get some breakfast off the stream. Any tips on photogrammetry scan cleaning? Um, I used to be 
I used to be a 3D operator, operator who's just like cleaning up photogrammetry or like like cleaning up like 3D scan data. So what I can say is that like it's better to just like DynaMesh and then predict back the details. Oh no no no. Um, the it's better to DynaMesh, zero mesh, and then project back the details and then do the cleanup by using subdivision workflows. Like, I was able to just like clean up the mesh in like six hours or so as my job. So, usually it works out. But it really usually depends on what kind of like shape or what kind of like object you're scanning and like fixing. If it's hard surface, uh, I think it's a bit hard. If it's a human, it's it's very simple. closest no humans are not too hard because um, for example hard surface requires that like hard sharp um, topologies but for humans because it's organic you don't really need to like have a specific um, like sharp corners at the edges so it's easy to project and also because you have the shapes pretty much the same so you can use the um, other applications like ZWrap and you can wrap the um, base mesh to the um, the scan data, so you can have a cleaner topology or a specific clean topology that you can like apply onto the scan data, and then just project back the details. So by using that, you can have a better control over the shapes and topologies. So humans are not really hard to actually do some photogrammetry on if you have the right tools by the way but as my job i didn't really do any like custom brush making for photogrammetry editing so it's not really hard to do it's just like um, looking at the photos and trying to like replicate them as you go along. So. so the lost, like lost areas, like for example, if you have a shade on the model and that shade shaded part entirely is like lost data, uh, that's a hard one to fix, but. Like usually you just need to sculpt it. So. The hard part of like photogrammetry and like photo scans or in the three D scans is when to give up 
to like when to give up that you need to like not rely on the 3d data too much like you need to consider when to like not hold on to the actual data itself like that's the hardest part if you need to like shorten the amount of time you you're doing for the for the editing um it's better to just like give up the um, parts if you think it's difficult and then just switch switch on to the sculpting method or the polygon modeling method and then like refine and tweak by looking at the photos and then sometimes you need to make it from scratch like for example like i had a client where where the kids like legs are always moving about and i the, the 3d scan wasn't able to like record or replicate the legs so what i did was like i just gave up and just like started building the entire leg from the photo <laughs> and like it's fine for a 3d print if it's like for like if the task is to perfectly replicate the uh photograph photogrammetry or the scan date sp scan subject and if that's the task um, you need to record it again but for for my case it was just for like 3d printing so um i just gave up on the entire data and just started building it from scratch <laughs> so yeah the hard spot is that like you like giving up on the data like i tried to salvage a part of the leg and like try to like combine it with my sculpting but at the end it didn't, it didn't really look like the leg so it's it's better to just like switch to a cylinder and then start from there <laughs> But yeah, if you can re uh, like ask for a retake or re photo shoot, uh, photo shoot, then yeah, it's better to do that. But if it's not worth the time and like money and effort, and if it's not the actual task itself, like if you just need a look, like leg looking thing, <laughs> you just need to do that. Like for example, another one would be black shoes. Especially like black shiny shoes, you can't really do a like three D scan on it because like the method you can use for three D scan was uh, the one I was using is a reflect or er, reflection based. So it, you put a flash onto the mesh, and then it's like detecting the reflections like with two cameras and it's yeah black hair as well like especially like japanese is known for their black hair right <laughs> like most of the clients are basically black hair so you can't really scan the um scan the hairs right so the the reseller at the time um recom recommended me to use the um xbox um what was it the xbox connect i think it was the connect um to this to use a different method of scanning the hairs but like i really like did, like i tried it tried it once and it didn't come up with it didn't give me a good result so I just basically gave up the entire workflow of making hairs. So what I did was just like, basically I sculpted the entire hairs 
<laughs> manually from the photo photograph. Yeah, if it has a different kind of like method for scanning, it I think it works, but usually it's not worth the like equipment price and the amount of time you spend. So for especially for like shiny shoes, um, what I did was like I basically made couples like base mesh for the shoes and then use that for um, the base. And then if it's a specific sh like shoes that they wanted or the, the customers needed. Uh, I just made it from scratch. Um, can you show me how to put detail on simple service? What kind of like, details? Starch? You mean scratch? I don't I, what is the question um, can you show me how to put details stretch on simple surface hello welcome welcome Do you use layers often? Uh, depends. Um, I'm not really. I don't really use layers that much. But for example, like Sakaki Sakaki-san is using a lot of like layers in his workflow. But yeah, I sometimes use it for um, meshes that I need to. I I I know that I need to like work on several versions of the details, or I'm using layers so I can like specifically um, retain the poses that I'm planning to use. So it depends. Actually, what is the main purpose? I don't even know how to how uh, how to use the layer. Oh, so for the layers, um, for example, I, I can show you an example. So if I have some kind of like a cloth, and for example, if I make a layer from the tool palette, if I add a layer, and then if I do some like 
sculpting on top of it like this. So if I have something like this, right? And what I can do is I can remove the sculpting details I just did. And like slide. Like if I don't really need that kind of like sharp transitions, I can tweak the parameters to have it more um, shallow or if I wanted a layer to be 100% I can do that and if I make a new layer for example if I have another like details like What should I add? If I add some like um, leather textures, so if you go to the alpha, there's a leather skinny and leathery skin ninety nine dot psd or something like that, and then if I add like layers using this method, let me just like add it slightly so it doesn't really like mess it too much but like for example if I have a leathery kind of like texture on top of it like this and like for example, if I wanted to like edit the um, the folds or the 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 major kind of like shapes, I can go back to the the initial like the 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 top layer and then edit the folds a bit more. But at the same time, I can I can hide the the details I added on top of it. So you can see there's no like de leathery details right now, but if I like start sculpting the the major shapes or the details on the other layer and then if i like the shape and if i confirm and then switch back to the leathery detailed layer i can see the details applied on top of it or i can just even like add it as a positive which is the reverse version of the um the negative i sculpted so it adds this kind of like a flexibility on like detail adding or um, the shape building so this is how you use layers like you need to for the layers you can't change the vertex order for example and you can't change the poly poly count because it relies on the um the vertex order of the shape so you just need to keep that one in mind, but like there's no like huge restrictions when it comes to layers. I mean brush when you making something more detailed like you're sculpting too many stretch over surface. Oh, you mean oh? I think I think it's better to just use alpha as that in that case. Like you can switch to standard brush, um, set some alphas. Like for example, I tend to use the um, the leathery skins or the other leathery skin shapes. Like for example, I can use this. 
and then set the stroke to the drag rectangle and then using the layer system I can just add these kind of like details and if it's too weak you can um, change the intensity but if, it, if it's enough like it's very handy like you can do something like this and if you don't like the results you can um, remove the entire layer or like you can tweak the parameters a bit so it doesn't really go too far or you can just like you use the smoothing to actually get some like shapes tweaked so you can use the, all the methods that like I showed so let's just go back to the sculpt I was doing I think I was making some edits on the hairs So currently this like strand is like evenly like shaped. So I'm gonna try to break that and like evenness. And sometimes it's better to like use the smooth without the hundred percent of the intensity. When you do characters, you build all the characters from zero? Um, depends. Like for this model, I didn't use the, uh, I'm, I'm just reusing the base mesh that I made in the past. But like for like professionals, like for, if you're working in the production, I think you're not gonna make the characters um, from scratch. Like you just have a template you start from. But like I usually tend to make the characters from scratch by like starting from a sphere and then getting all the shapes done but it depends like if I have time or not or if I'm like in the mood of like building characters from scratch but for for the designs itself um, I'm, I'm usually just like coming up for, with the designs on the fly Unless it's a fan art or something like that. If it's a fan art, like I have a huge like chunk of references. I'm getting too hungry. I can't really focus on the stream. <laughs> I don't know why, but like I'm very like like sleepy and like hungry all the time recently. So 
I don't know what's happening to my body. Oh, by the way, if the stroke you're like drawing is like not really steady, you can use the lazy mouse and then you can just tweak the lazy radius to like 25. And then you can like slowly draw a line smoothly. Uh, yeah, when you get it, it's nice. I know in the anime community, uh, onigiri is jelly, jelly donut. <laughs> yeah, I like tuna onigiri. It's very nice. You know, onigiri has two kind of like shapes, basically. Uh, one is a circle shape, and one is triangle. And that's the usual stuff that you see in the convenience stores. You know why there's two shapes? Well, at least, um, do you know which is older in the shape? So one shape became, um, well, one shape was added later on. So for onigiris, traditionally it was a circle shape, and like you don't, you didn't really have triangle onigiris recent until recently. Like it, I think it was added in the nineteen eighties because convenience stores wanted to like sell onigiris, and like making them triangle was easier, easier for them to carry around. So that's the reason why they made triangle onigiri. But after that, they made the onigiris circular because they remind that reminded people, or they reminded the um, like salary workers um, who were buying onigiris of their like house like like homemade like lunch boxes. So that's the reason why they made circular onigiris. So they wanted to have that like. Um, Homemade feel to the convenience stores like only giving. So triangles uh, was added by a industrial reason for convenience, and it became really popular after that. But usually it was just circles and like it looked like a bomb kind of like shape. And especially um, in Japan, like those kind of like sphere onigiris, um, it's called bakudan, and <laughs> it, it just means literally a bomb. Um, this fact that like not a not a lot of like Japanese people know this, they forgot about it. <laughs> By the way, making triangle onigiris in like industries or in the in the manufacturing way, uh, they just like have a triangle like shape you cut out from. And then you can just put some push some rice into it to, to make some like triangle shapes.
but if you want to make triangle shapes in you, on your own you need to like bend your fingers like into a triangle shape and then try to fit the rice like you need to like rotate the like onigiri's like rice to like like fit into the folds of the fingers and then like turn it around so it makes a triangle <laughs> it's tricky. I, I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it either. Okay, so the hair is done. And I think I just need to like combine it again and then just like retopologize so I have a cleaner version of this. Also, um, like when I see Western figurines, the the point of the like the hair is not really like pointy that much. It's very round. So what I usually say to like artists who are make, who are making like Japanese kind of like style figurines to use the Aku curve, which is the brush curve, um, Aku curve, and then use this to like make the hairs slightly pointy, because like if you like if I see a Western artist and who's like making figurines which looks Japanese. And like if I look into details, those hairs not really like sharp and at all. Like it feels like it feels like this, but it's not really sharp. So one method of like distinguishing between those kind of like shapes is that like you can use the Aku curve to get that precise like sharpness. And it does really make a difference, especially like these kind of like, if it's like going straight or it, 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 is it going like round and like it, is it moving towards another side. These ma these kind of like details matter, but like I don't see much Western artists like covering these kind of like edges or slight details it depends i guess but like when i see Figurines, especially, um, I see the, see the difference. Okay, so I just need to use the Dynamesh and smooth out details. Uh, let me just delete the older history and then press Control and retopologize. Also, when you're sculpting hairs, especially these kind of like short kind of like hairs, uh, one thing 
you might need to consider is that where the hair is getting hit on your like shoulders or the cloth and like those kind of like factors changes the sh direction of the hairs so um, if your character's hair is short enough it's going to affect how the hairs are going to like like it's going to change the hair's direction so just keep that in mind So I made this character's like hairs like go going left. So I think she has a bit of a habit of like um, like moving the hairs slightly to the left, or the the like she's like swiping the hairs on the left side. So I I wanted to have this kind of like left um, hair like like the hairs to go going left. Hello. Oh, thanks. Uh, I think I should just tweak the facial expressions a bit. Usually if I'm like tweaking the facial expressions, I'm using the layers to actually get the shapes. I usually want to keep the symmetry as much as possible and I'm using the stager to rotate the faces.
Oh, missed the polypaint. Um, when I did the polypaint for the um, the cloth, I just used the textures, and I just made some like drag rectangles and just like musty um, vertical strips and then horizontal strips and then just painted them over, and that's basically it. Um, I think I showed this on the first stream I made for this character. It's not it's not a hard way to do, so it's very simple. Just making a plane and then just painting them. So yeah, this is what I used. So I have a plane which is just like painted horizontally and vertically. And I just converted this to a part, uh, texture and then applied it onto the surface. So nothing hard. Uh, one common glitch I have noticed in ZBrush is sometimes sculptures area becomes invisible. Sculptured areas become invisible. Rotate creatures gone. Um, sculpted areas becomes invisible. Um, I don't know. Like I think you're just not like hitting the dynamic button on the solo, and then if you rotate, it's just like. Like isolating the mesh and then like coming back if you just like rotate back is that the thing and then if you just like remove the dynamic button it's not like um, making the mesh invisible Yeah, I I don't think we have that kind of like glitch. Like I think it's just an user error. Or it's better to update the latest version of ZBrush. Yeah, so solo dynamic is a solution where your PC spec might be not too high and if you want to speed up the process of the rotation it's the um, it's the recommended way to go but in the like recent ver re recent like modern um, hardware you don't really need to do that but if you're working with a higher dense mesh and then if you want to speed up the process it's better to just use the dynamic solo mode so some people are using this method. No, the area under the brush only. Um, which version are you using? If, if you're like suffering with the um, technical issues, I, I recommend you go to the support team. Uh, because we can't really talk in detail about the what kind of like version, what kind of like PC are you using, and like I, I can't really go through that in the um, stream in the comment section. It's gonna be a mess. So um, just contact us through the support team. Like I, I really want to like support people who are like having issues, but like it's very hard when it comes to like streaming and then just having a lot of people commenting on one subject and then if it's not the like the solution, I need to go through it again and then it's it's gonna be a mess. So um, it's better to contact us from the support team and then get a support from there. How did you apply the textures? Does surface have UVs? Oh uh, yeah. Um, so I have a mesh, and 
it looks like this. And without textures, it looks like this, right? And it has a dynamic subdivision thickness. And what I did was just use a um, UV master to a one-sided mesh and like the either the UV that looks like this and then if I put a texture onto this it looks like this and then if I add a thickness to it it basically looks like a hoodie with a thickness to it um, you can look back on the stream if you want and like you can look up the the first stream I did for this model I think I made a hoodie in the first stream so yeah um, because it's a rough UV editing you can see the big huge seam right here but for me like it's not an issue like because it's a part of a fashion <laughs> like it's just stitching around patterns so don't look too much odd but if you're working on a project and if it's like requires a specific seam you need you just need to adjust the seams When you're working with um, dynamic subdivision levels with thickness, it's sometimes a bit slow. So uh, most of the cases I just like um, add the thickness if I'm happy with the mesh. But for this one, um, I'm keeping the subdivision levels with the thickness as much as possible because um, it's easy to just go back and forth between the textures and editing the stuff. Uh, where do you do the render? Um, I usually use the key shot, key shot 11 for the renders, but you can use whatever you want. Like you can send it back to another application. You can do the rendering in ZBrush. And like, for example, if I select the skin shade four and with the setting from now oh, let me just save this beforehand uh where is it i'm editing too much data and i, I can't i can't find the folder i'm looking for uh, where is it? Oh, here it is. Yeah. Okay, so I can do the rendering inside ZBrush, like for example, if I set the material to the material inside the material palette, like for example, NPR shading. And then if I change the light position slightly, like so. And then if I render it like this, it 
using VPR. You can have a bit of a, like a NPR rendering feel to it as well. So you can use whatever you want. Or you can use the, um, the base material method and then just tweak the colors if you need. And like, if you don't want this kind of like a dark, darker color, you can use the um, diffuse setting to one and then just change the ambient. And yeah, you can have this kind of like look as well. So a lot of things, a lot of methods. So next week I'm going to work on the socks and a couple of details and then it should be done. Uh, no, not the next week, um, the next next week. <laughs> I'm doing the Japanese stream on the next week, so Oh, by the way, um, I'm making a mech character on the Japanese stream. You, it's in, it's all like mostly explained in Japanese. Sometimes I'm answering stuff in English, but like you can check that out as well. And you can see that. What camera focal distance do you use? I don't usually put some like perspectives until I'm finished with the model and if I'm finished with the model I can just I'm using just like 50 or 60 for the angles and this is the model I'm working on on the Japanese stream it's a mech mecha musume kind of like stuff so you can check that out as well and um, I think it's a wrap for my stream time so thank you for watching and if you have any questions just hit me up on discord if you need um, discord is So, see you next time. Bye.